Hey everybody, so as we're getting started tonight, if you will, uh, just leave me a comment. Let me know that you're here with us and uh, I know we've got a few folks already following, so look forward to others joining us. And we're going to try to keep this um, relatively brief, although our normal Sunday night crowd will know that I, I normally uh, we go rather long, about, a, about an hour or so, but we'll try not to go that long tonight. Uh, but we do want to walk through this word together. And uh, as much as I enjoy being able to worship uh, with you at a distance today, going through the same passage of scripture, going through uh, the same hymns and, and and reading God's word together and then hearing that word preached, uh, I think this will be a, a little bit more interactive and uh, hopefully we'll connect our hearts together a bit more in part of our normal routine. And routine is really uh, important right now, especially for a lot of us who are scattered abroad and uh, we're not able to go through maybe some of our normal activities. And so it should be good for us as a church family and then for other friends uh, who may join us to walk through this word together and uh, for us just to do something that we're accustomed to. So um, it's six o'clock and uh, I'm going to begin in just a moment. We're going to walk through Ezra chapter seven. And what that'll look like is that we'll read Ezra chapter seven together. Um, I'm going to walk us back through the beginning half of this book through chapters one through six, bring us all up to speed, because I know there will be a lot of you that haven't been with us before as we've uh, been walking through this over the last six weeks or so. And so uh, I'll bring us up to speed and then we're going to walk through chapter seven. Uh, and earlier I was saying we're going to see it in four different parts. Um, so there's the introduction of Ezra. Uh, then there's the, the exiles return, the second wave of exiles returning into the land of Jerusalem, into the land of Judah. And then we're going to see the commissioning of those exiles by King Artaxerxes. We'll read the letter that Ezra has included. Uh, and then we're going to end with the doxology of Ezra. So uh, a word of praise to God. And so we look uh, forward to that together. Um, in just a few moments, we'll be beginning and uh, we'll be beginning and uh, reading that word. So let just a few more folks get here with us and then we're going to dive in. All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and begin and uh, we're going to read uh, God's word together. But first, I'm going to pray for us and ask God to open our hearts and help us to understand. Uh, so why don't we pray together and then we'll, we'll go into Ezra chapter seven. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness to us in all things. We're thankful, Lord, that uh, even in the middle of a public health crisis, that you've given us the means to be together as God's people. Uh, we're reminded of the Apostle Paul and his writing to the church at Corinth that he said, uh, though he could not be there in body, though he was absent in body, he was present in spirit. And today, all across uh, our community, and indeed all across the nation, the people of God have come together, not in person, not in body, but in spirit. And we are grateful that we've been able to do that. And we're thankful for the technology that you've given us so that we have the ability to do that in even more uh, of a connected way. I thank you, God, uh, for the for the church family that I have and am privileged to pastor for the brothers and sisters uh, of Friendship Baptist Church. I thank you, God, that that wherever they are tonight, that they're well and that they're held in your hands, that they they are recipients of your grace. And God, I pray that even now you would use your word to form them further to the image of your blessed son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for this time that we have. Would you open our hearts and help us to obey, open our, e our eyes and help us to see in our ears and help us to hear your word for us this day. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So uh, we're going to read together Ezra chapter seven, Ezra chapter seven, and then we'll come up to speed. So uh, catch all, catch along with us, follow along with us, and uh, this will be beneficial, I think. So Ezra chapter seven, beginning in verse one, it says, now after this, in the reign of Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, son of Marioth, son of Zerahiah, son of Uzi, son of Buki, son of Abishua, son of Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra went up from Babylonia. 
He was a scribe, skilled in the law of Moses, that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given, and the king granted him all that he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was upon him. And there went up also to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king, some of the people of Israel, and some of the priests and Levites, the singers and gatekeepers, the temple servants. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first day of the first month, he began to go up from Babylonia. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem, for the good hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. This is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra the priest, the scribe, a man learned in matters of commandments of the Lord and his statutes for Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, peace. And now I make a decree that anyone of the people of Israel, or their priests, or Levites in my kingdom, who freely offers to go to Jerusalem, may go with you. For you are sent by the king and his seven counselors to make inquiries about Judah and Jerusalem, according to the law of your God, which is in your hand, and also to carry the silver and gold that the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem, with all the silver and gold that you shall find in the whole province of Babylonia. And with the free will offerings of the people and the priests, vowed willingly for the house of their God that is in Jerusalem. With this money then, you shall with all diligence buy bulls, rams, and lambs, with their grain offerings and their drink offerings, and you shall offer them on the altar of the house of your God that is in Jerusalem. Whatever seems good to you and your brothers to do with the rest of the silver and gold, you may do according to the will of your God. The vessels that have been given you for the service of the house of your God, you shall deliver before the God of Jerusalem. And whatever else is required for the house of your God, which it falls to you to provide, you may provide it out of the king's treasury. And I, Artaxerxes, king, make a decree to all the treasurers in the province beyond the river. Whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, requires of you, let it be done with all diligence, up to 100 talents of silver, 100 cores of, of wheat, 100 baths of wine, 100 baths of oil, and salt without prescribing how much. Whatever is decreed by the God of heaven, let it be done in full for the house of the God of heaven, lest his wrath be against the realm of the king and his sons. We also notify you that it shall not be lawful to impose tribute, custom, or toll on any one of the priests, the Levites, the singers, the doorkeepers, the temple servants, or of other servants of this house of God. And you, Ezra, according to the wisdom of your God that is in your hand, Appoint magistrates and judges who may judge all the people in the province beyond the river, all such as know the laws of your God, and those who do not know them you shall teach. Whoever will not obey the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be strictly executed on him, whether for death or for banishment or for confiscation of his goods or for imprisonment. Blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king to beautify the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem and who extended to me his steadfast love before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty officers. I took courage for the hand of the Lord my God was on me and I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. So Ezra chapter seven comes uh, at a breaking point in the book, this book is divided into two parts, Ezra chapters 1 through 6, and then chapters 7 through 10. Uh, and in this chapter, what we find is that Ezra, the book's namesake, and perhaps even the editor or writer of this book, he has finally come on the scene, uh, and he is making his return into the land of Jerusalem, into the land of Judah, with the second wave of exiles coming back into the land. And so what I want us to do is let's catch ourselves up to speed. Let's remember what's gone on so far and then dive into Ezra chapter seven. 
What we've been talking about over these last several weeks is that Ezra is a book where we learn about rebuilding. It's a book of God's people who have been exiled in a foreign land, coming back home and rebuilding the house of God in Jerusalem and beginning the work of rebuilding their land, of restoring the land that God has given to his covenant people, Israel. And what we find in Ezra chapter 1 all the way to the end, to Ezra chapter 10, is that through this rebuilding process, God's people are getting to know God better. We're learning more and more of God's character. One of the things that I think is good for us to stop and think about even now is that in this present difficulty that we're facing in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, both here in the state of Alabama and around the world, one of the things that God is doing that we can say definitively is that God is trying to teach us more about himself. God is using this present difficulty, these temporary trials to teach us about his character, about his nature, about the way that he interacts with his people. One of the things that we're coming to learn is that God's mercy is sufficient, that his grace is sufficient. We're we're coming to learn in this season that God's spirit gives us unity as his people, that his gospel gives us unity as his people, even as we're at a distance. See, one of the things that I said to several of our members today who were texting and saying, hey, Pastor, we love the sermon. We're grateful that that we were able to hear God's word today, uh, even in this strange season. Uh, I said back to most all of them, I am thankful that we were able to be together today, not because we were together in person, but because we were gathered together in the word of God. We came together in the same word, and God's leading us together forward as his people and showing us that his word is sufficient. So throughout the book of Ezra, we're learning about the character of God. And in Ezra chapter one, what we learn is that God is shown to have perfect timing in sending the exiles, uh, in ending the exile in Babylon and in, in using the foretold King Cyrus to free his people. In Ezra chapter 1, the book opens with uh, a scene of God's hand being upon uh, the king of of the Medes and the Persians, a, a man named Cyrus, whom God used to defeat the Babylonians in the year 539 B.C. And then we see God's spirit stirring up the hearts of his people to long to return to the land, uh, to the land of Judah, the land of Jerusalem, where their home is. The reason that God is doing this is because through the prophet Jeremiah, God foretold that his people were going to endure a season of exile for about 70 years, for for a period of 70 years. And at the end of that period, God was going to free them and return them from their captivity. In Isaiah, we learned that the agent of that return, the one God was going to use to bring about that return to the land of Israel, was a king named Cyrus. Uh, In Isaiah chapter 44 and Isaiah chapter 45, we read about Cyrus, that he was going to be a shepherd for God's people, that he would be the, the agent, the anointed one that God would use to deliver his people from the exile and bring them back into the land. Well, right on time, right on target, uh, after the people of God began to face exile and to endure uh, years of hardship, beginning in around the year 612 B.C., now almost 70 years later, 539 B.C., God's people are beginning uh, to embrace freedom, embrace a return to the land of promise. And that is because God has raised up the promised King Cyrus to allow his people to go free from exile and return to their promised land. In Ezra chapter 2, what we saw was an accounting of God's people. And here's what we learned about God. God in Ezra chapter 2 was shown to have perfect judgment in sorting out the priestly families who lost track of their lineage, and he was shown to be a perfect owner who took full account of his people. Ezra chapter two uh, is a listing. It's a numbering. It's it, it is a a record of all the people who came back into the land of Judah in the first wave of return from the exile. And one of the things that we learned in Ezra chapter two is that God is a faithful owner. He is the ultimate owner. God doesn't lose anything that belongs to Him. We can take comfort in that. Comfort in the fact that. 
Every one of us who belongs to the Lord will not be lost. One of the things that we know about God's nature is that God the Father has given people into the hand of God the Son, and God the Son holds the people of the Father in his hand so that they are never lost. Jesus said that. He said that he doesn't lose those who are entrusted to him by the Father. So here we're reminded that God is a faithful owner. He keeps perfect records. He has a full account. And not only does God know the names of his people, not only does he know how many people are his, but God also knows what his people do in service to him. One of the things that we saw in Ezra chapter 2 is that God takes note of the, of the work of his people, of what they do in service to him and his kingdom. And that is such a comfort to us because it means this, that even if our work for God and his kingdom is not known to others in this world, even if, if we never have a, a public stage, even if we're never shown the limelight, we can rest assured that everything we do for God is known by him and everything we do for God, it has a place in his economy. It's something that he uses to magnify his name and to extend his kingdom. So Ezra chapter two, we learn that God is a faithful owner. We also learn that he's a faithful judge. He's the perfect judge who, who, who sorts out issues. We're gonna see it tonight in Ezra chapter seven that one of the first things we learn about Ezra is his genealogy. And I believe the reason Ezra begins by recounting his genealogy is because of something we learned in chapter two. In Ezra two verses 61 to 63, we're told about some priestly families who wanted to begin service in the temple again, but they were not able to at first because they couldn't prove their genealogy. And so the ruling of the governors was they cannot serve until there's a priest who can use the Urim and Thummim in order to make a decision, in order to give a call from the Lord, a judgment from the Lord about their nature. Are they really priests? Are they really the descendants of Aaron who have a right to serve among God's people? And so uh, we're reminded from that, that all Ultimately, there were some people who came uh, into the land. There were some uh, who were able to serve as priests. They got their genealogy, genealogy straightened out. And, and there we learned that God is the perfect judge, that he, he gave an answer where one was needed. In Ezra chapter 3, we saw the people of God beginning to rebuild the altar of God and rebuilding the foundation of the temple. And here's what we learned, that God was shown to have perfect order in establishing the altar of the temple and perfect goodness in bringing Israel home. In fact, at the end of, Ch of Ezra chapter 3, what we saw was a celebration of sorts. God's people were celebrating that, the, that they had come home into the land that the altar had been built, that the foundation of the temple had been laid. They were celebrating, they were worshiping, they were overjoyed. But even in the middle of that, one of the things we took note of is that there were a lot of people who were weeping while others were worshiping. And so we talked about the fact that in a rebuilding movement of God, there's always a camp of people who are, who are excited, who are joyful about what God is going to do in the future. And then there are people who are not so excited, people who are looking back on what has been, remembering the former days and saying there couldn't possibly be as good of a work going forward as what we once knew. So we talked about how those who are on the celebrating or the worshiping side of a rebuilding movement can show respect to those who are on the weeping side and vice versa. As we together as God's people seek to keep going forward, rebuilding for his glory. In Ezra chapter 4, we had a, a very strange situation to deal with. You may remember that in Ezra chapter 4, what we have is, is two timelines going on. Ezra chapter 4 verses 1 through 5 uh, is one timeline. It's the current timeline in the story. It's the first wave of the rebuilding, first wave of exiles coming to the land, first work being done upon the temple. And then beginning in verse six, what we have is something from Ezra's own day, from the second wave of exiles that go into the land from, from about 60 years down the road. And the reason that we think Ezra interjects this story from his own timeline back into the first wave of exiles is because Ezra longs 
for God's people to know God is going to overcome all of their difficulties and he will accomplish his plan. You see, what we learned in Ezra chapter four is that God is shown to have perfect faithfulness in bringing God's people through conflict with unbelievers. Those first wave of exiles who came back into the land in around the year 538, when they've just begun work on the temple, they are stalled out. There, There is a, a, a conflict that arises with their neighbors in the land. And so they're forced to wait for a ruling from the king. They have to wait for quite a long time, a period of 16 years. They wait until finally in the reign of a second king of the Medes and Persians, a king named Darius, they are given a ruling that allows them to return to their work. Uh, And for about six years, they labor. And ultimately in the year 516, they're able to complete the building of the temple. In Ezra chapter five, we saw that God is shown to have perfect favor in enabling his people to construct the temple. In Ezra chapter six, we saw that God is shown to be the perfect giver of joy after the completion of the temple when the people of God celebrate the temple's completion by reinstituting the celebration of the Passover. You see, one of the things that we see is that God's people, as they celebrate the building of the temple, as they celebrate the Passover, they are filled with joy. Joy that doesn't come from their circumstances, joy that doesn't come from from their completeness in the land. After all, there's still work to be done on the city. There's still work to be done in, in gaining standing in the land over their neighbors. But But here they have a joy that comes from the Lord. God gives his people joy. So we see that joy is something that comes from the Lord, from our relationship with him, and not something that comes from our temporary circumstances. And my goodness, in the days in which we live, that is good to remember, because it would be very easy for us right now to lose our joy. So that's Ezra 1 through 6. And that's all of what happens in the first wave of returned exiles from the land of Babylon into the land of Judah. That's what happens as the temple is rebuilt and it finishes, that that construction is finished in the year 516 BC. The second temple is finished then. And then between the end of Ezra chapter six and the beginning of Ezra chapter seven, there is an interlude of 58 years until Ezra comes on the scene. And so what I want us to talk about tonight in Ezra chapter seven, four key words. First of all, I want us to talk about preparation. Then I want us to talk about implementation. And then I want us to talk about exaltation. And then finally, I want us to talk about magnification. Okay, so preparation, implementation, exaltation, magnification. So first of all, let's talk about implementation. And that's Ezra chapter seven, verses one through six. And here what we have is an introduction to Ezra, not the book, but Ezra the priest, Ezra the scribe. So let's be reminded that in Ezra chapter seven and verse one, we are introduced to a new time period. It's the reign of Artaxerxes, the king of Persia. Artaxerxes reigned beginning in the year 465 BC, and he reigned until the year 424 BC. So Ezra, in the beginning, this is in the beginning of his reign. And what we learn later on, verse seven of chapter seven, is that Ezra's return to the land comes seven years into the reign of King Artaxerxes. And so the year 458 is when we'll say that Ezra returned to the land of Judah from the land of exile in Babylon. In our introduction to Ezra, one of the things that we learn is about his genealogy. We have so much information given to us about Ezra's lineage. From beginning in verse 2, we begin to hear about who Ezra descends from all the way back to Aaron the priest. We might wonder, why this lineage? Why do we have this genealogy? Why is it so important that Ezra includes this here? Well, remember back in Ezra chapter 2, that there were those priestly families who said that they were priests and they were descended from priests, but they couldn't prove their genealogy. There wasn't a record. And the governors of the day, they said, wait, they can't serve as priests until we're certain, until God, by the by the high priest, through the use of the Urim and Thummim, gives a ruling about whether or not these men do indeed descend from priestly families. 
It was important because the worship of God could not be marred. It had to be pure. The leaders had to be pure. They had to have a right to serve the people of God by interceding on their behalf and through the offering of sacrifices and through the conduction of worship. So by giving us the genealogy of Ezra here in Ezra chapter 7, verses 2 and 3 and 4, one of the things that we understand from the beginning is that Ezra has the right to rule as a priest, to serve as a priest and as a scribe for the people of Israel. So we shouldn't take uh, any question. We shouldn't wonder, does Ezra really fit here? Does he really have this right? Well, yes, he does. He's got the right to lead God's people, to be a priest for God's people because of his descent from Aaron. So in Ezra chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, we see his this introduction and we learn that Ezra, he lives in the time of Artaxerxes, who reigned 465 to 424. We see that Ezra, he, he is descended from the priest. And then one of the things that we see about Ezra is we see his work. We see in verse 6, this Ezra, not, not any other Ezra, but this Ezra, the one descended from Aaron, went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. And the king granted him all that he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was upon him. Here's why I want to talk about preparation. Ezra had been preparing for this day. He may have not have known when it was coming. He may not have known how God was going to use him. He may not have known what it was that God was going to to do to orchestrate his return to the land of promise. But here's what Ezra knew, that he was of a priestly family and that his calling was to prepare himself for service to God and to God's people. And so he was trained in the law. He was a scribe according to the law of Moses. That means that not only could he make copies of the law, was he skilled in as a copyist, but he also was trained to be an interpreter of the law. He was one who was gifted to understand and to teach God's people the law. In fact, when we read the commissioning letter of King Artaxerxes for Ezra to return to the land, one of the things that Artaxerxes says is that all the people are supposed to obey the law of the Lord and those who do not know it should be taught by Ezra. Ezra had been preparing for this day to return to the land of the exile. Can I just talk to you about preparation for a moment? This season that we're in, let's let's talk about right now, right here and now, God has brought the world to a halt. In the face of COVID-19, the coronavirus, the world as we know it has come to a halt. So many of the things that we take for granted are stopped right now. Everyone is paused. Everyone is, 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 is coming to realize that life as we know it, it's not going to exist for a few weeks. We're going to have to get through this thing in a different way. And I believe one of the reasons that God has visited this season upon us is so that we can prepare. Prepare for something great. Prepare for a stirring of his spirit. Prepare for a moving of his hand upon our world. Brothers and sisters, we have long been seeking as the people of God a revival, a stirring of the hearts of our of our fellow men and women, of the citizens of our nation and, and of the world to come back to the Lord, to turn their hearts to Christ. And I firmly believe that God is doing a work of revival in this world through the use of this virus. God is getting our attention. God is compelling us to come to a stop and to contemplate our lives and ultimately the gift of his grace through the work of his son, Jesus Christ. And one of the things that you and I have to do as the people of God, we have to prepare to minister to God's people 
So I, I want to know, what are you doing in this season? Now, some of you are still working. Some of you are are, are still having to, to, to balance all of the, the medical and health restrictions and warnings with, with, with caring for grandkids and, and, and kids and, and with going to work every day. I'm going to the office every day and, and, and trying to keep our church focused and moving forward. I understand that some of you, you've got jobs where, where you can't work from home. You've got to go to the office. But for a lot of us right now, We've got more time on our hands than maybe we've had in a good long while. I wonder, are we going to spend all of that time in front of a television, watching Netflix, streaming Amazon Prime videos? And are we going to spend all that time catching up on on our latest and greatest novels? Are we going to spend all of this time uh, on social media trying to find out all the latest information about this virus? Or... Or will we make an effort as the people of God to spend some time, some serious time in the word? Will we treat this as a season of preparation? If it lasts two weeks or if it lasts two months, will this be a season when we thank God for bringing us to a halt, for forcing us to stop, not to be able to run as wide open as we do in this modern life that we live, but instead to be compelled to slow down and to use this time to prepare. See, brothers and sisters, right now, you and I, in many ways, we are forced to wait. But just because we are forced to wait does not mean that we are forced to waste time. Nothing about this season compels us to veg out on the couch for days on end and ignore the rest of the world and ignore what God is trying to do. This should be a season where we're called and moved by the Spirit of God to prepare for what God wants to do in days to come. So I wonder, will you use these days to invest in yourself? One of the things uh, that we'll be doing, I'll talk about this again at the end. One of the things that we're going to do as a church family in these days is we're going to give as much content, biblical teaching content to you as we possibly can. Okay, so right now we're doing uh, this. We had Sunday morning sermon today from John 9. If you didn't catch it, I encourage you to check out the website and catch up on that. Uh, we gave a worship guide so that you didn't have to just listen to a sermon. You also had prompts for prayer and you had scripture readings and, and you had some songs that you could sing together with your family. And, and let me just say, if you didn't take time to do that, if you didn't take time to sing, if you only streamed the sermon, then your worship was not complete. God is worthy of your praise and song. So why don't you go back and look those hymns up, play the Spotify playlist and worship along. We're also going to be bringing you this week some uh, some short videos of, of teaching through the book of First Thessalonians. They'll start appearing tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock, and they'll come forward about 7 o'clock each day. And those will be a digital discipleship series where we just every day check in with one another and walk through God's Word. We're still going to have some video content in the evenings where I come to, to Facebook and YouTube for a few moments and share from God's Word together. What I'm saying is I, I'm doing all I can as a pastor. And our church is doing all it can as a body to make sure that you are equipped with scripture so that you're using this time, not as a waste, but as an investment in yourself to be the person that God has called you to be, to be a more fully formed follower of Jesus Christ, to be more faithful in your walk and to prepare for what's coming, an opportunity to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So number one In the introduction to Ezra, as we learn about his life, let us think about this season that God has brought us to as a time for preparation. Ezra prepared. He prepared by training himself in the law, by becoming adept in his his understanding of the law, in his ability to teach the law. And ultimately, God used that to turn his life around and bring him as a leader back into the land of promise, leading among God's people. So first of all, we talk about preparation. Second, I want us to think about implementation. Look there at verse 7 of chapter 7. It says, There went up also to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king, some of the people of Israel and some of the priests and Levites, the singers and gatekeepers and the temple servants. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the seventh month, 
which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first day of the first month, he began to go up from Babylonia. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem for the good hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. So one of the things that we learn about Ezra is that he's a priest and a scribe. And that means that he's been preparing to teach the law, preparing to study God's law. But not only do we see in Ezra's life preparation, but we also see implementation. It says there in verse 9 that when Ezra came into the land, when he came back into Jerusalem, he, he was he was doing the work that he'd been preparing for. See verse 10, Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it. See, Ezra, in this work of leading God's people back into the land, in this work of teaching the statutes of the Lord, in this work of, of, of maintaining a right understanding of the law of God, Ezra was putting his training to good use. See, Ezra was not just a hearer of the word. Ezra was a doer of the word. What we see here that Ezra is coming into the land along with this second wave of exiles who are returning from Babylon back into the land of promise, into Judah, into the land uh, of Jerusalem. They're doing this in the year 458 BC. It's the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes, the king of Persia. And Ezra, he leaves about March, the first month of the year. So he leaves at the end of March and, and he arrives at the beginning, uh, leaves at the, the beginning of the first month of the year, which is March on our calendar, the Gregorian calendar. And, and he arrives in the first day of the fifth month of the Jewish calendar. That's about July for us. So from the end of March to the middle of July, Ezra's on his way, on his way to Jerusalem from Babylon. And finally, he arrives in Jerusalem uh, around July of 458 BC, and he sets about the work to which he's been called, the work that God has, has set apart for him, the work that God has commissioned for him to do through uh, the, the work of the king of Persia, Artaxerxes. And one of the things that we learn about God's favor resting upon Ezra is that God's favor rests upon Ezra, not because Ezra wanted to bring glory to his own name, not because Ezra uh, wanted to be well thought of in the, in the community of Israel, but because Ezra had studied the law of God so that he might do it and teach it. See, Ezra put God's law into practice. He implemented what he studied and prepared for. And one of the things that, that I had to deal with growing up was uh, I had a father who would often say what maybe some of you moms and dads have often said to your children, do as I say, not as I do. There were a lot of times when, when my daddy wanted us to do things that he didn't necessarily do himself, but he knew were good for us. And sometimes we would look at him and think, well, if it was so good, if it was so wonderful, if it was so beneficial, why, why don't you do them yourself? You know, sometimes God's people look at their leaders and, and they don't want to follow, not because they don't see the benefit, not because uh, they don't see the, the work of God, not because they don't understand uh, the teaching to be from God himself, but because they don't see it practiced in the lives of their leaders. Ezra was not a hypocritical leader. What he taught, what he studied, what he prepared for, he put into practice in his own life. And not only did he prepare, and not only did he implement it in his own life, but then he taught it to others who would be able to implement it themselves. I cannot read this passage without thinking about what the Apostle Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1. You might remember this, that Paul says to Timothy, uh, what you have heard from me, pass on uh, to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What you've heard and seen in me, that's a generation of faithfulness. Pass it on to faithful men. So Timothy's the second generation. He passes it on to faithful men. That's a third generation who will be able to teach it to others also. That's a fourth generation. 
Paul understood that the nature of faithful Christian discipleship does not rest with simply us implementing God's word in our own lives and answering the call of Jesus Christ to follow him in our own lives, but it also is about us multiplying ourselves, replicating our faith in the lives of others. Ezra was about that work. He implemented God's word. He implemented the law of the Lord. He implemented all the things he prepared for and practiced in his own life in his teaching of the people of God to be faithful to the Lord. So I have to ask us to think for a moment about implementing God's word in our own lives. My high school principal used to say that we should be sitting on G and waiting on O, and O is opportunity. Brothers and sisters, opportunity is going to come in your life an opportunity to be faithful to the Lord, an opportunity to put his word into practice. And you may say, well, well, that would be a, an opportunity to evangelize. That's absolutely right. God, maybe even this week, maybe it'll be through a phone call or maybe it will be through, through the knock at the door of a neighbor who just needs some help. Maybe it will be uh, through something you'll see on a social media site, but, but maybe this week there's going to be an opportunity that comes for you to give witness to the hope that is within you, the hope that you have through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, my dear brothers and sisters, are you going to be ready for that opportunity? Are you willing to implement that word into your heart, uh, into your practice? Are you willing to take the gospel that you believe and preach and also put it into practice in your own life as you share the gospel with others. One of the other ways that we might put God's word into practice in these days is by by being a people of peace. We might implement God's word in these days by being a people who are not given to anxiety or given to panic or given to fear. You see, the times in which we live, this this response to COVID-19 has caused many people to be fearful, many people to panic, many people uh, to, to wonder about the future of their own lives and of the world, wonder if we're going to be able to make it through this season. We as the people of God ought to take the word that we've prepared in our own hearts, the word that we've sought to implement and and put it to practice. We ought to be a people who are at peace. If you caught the video yesterday, one of the things we talked about from Philippians chapter four is that the key to being a people who have the peace of God is that we do not bear our anxieties on our own. God calls us to relieve ourselves of the burden of fear, the burden of panic, the burden of anxiety by giving those things over to God in prayer. And when we have given those things to the Lord, we can be at peace. I I, throughout this whole season that God has brought to us have been regularly thinking about what Paul said in Colossians. Do you remember there that Paul said in Colossians, I think it's the third chapter, Paul said that we should let the peace of Christ rule in us. A part of letting the peace of Christ rule in us is allowing God to call the shots when difficulty comes our way. Rather than being like the rest of the world, saying one thing but doing another, we should put God's word into practice. We should implement this in our own lives when the opportunity comes. Can't help but think about the fact that sometimes death comes our way. I will never forget, I bet I've told you this before, but I'll never forget in the aftermath of my father's passing that I sent a text to my mom on Sunday morning. My daddy passed on Wednesday and Sunday morning I sent mama a text because I was up at home getting ready to go and preach to to my congregation there at London Baptist Church in Castleberry and and uh, getting ready to give God's word to them because that's what I needed to do. And and my family was all at home. They were all getting ready to go to church with my mom. And I sent mom a text and I said, daddy was a Christian. He would not have wanted us to be overcome by fear or by sorrow. We as his family, we ought to be in church today and worship the God that we believe in. And my family, I, I wish I could have been there with them that day. They they all took their place and, and there were my parents usually sat at First Baptist Church and, and there they were bearing witness to their faith in Jesus Christ. And I got a text later that day from my dear friend, Patty Peacher. She sent me a text and she said, it was so good to see your mother in church today worshiping Jesus. 
Brothers and sisters, that's what it means to implement God's word. Opportunity is going to come. There's going to come a moment of sorrow when you can display hope. There's going to come a moment of panic when you can display peace. There's going to come a moment of, of overwhelming fear when you can point to the God who offers life by faith in his son Jesus. Will you be ready to implement the word prepared in your heart when the opportunity comes? Ezra was a man of preparation, a man of implementation. But then we see that God brought to Ezra exaltation. What we see in verses 11 through 26 is an exaltation of Ezra. God blesses Ezra's faithfulness by putting his hand of favor, his hand of, uh, of blessing, his hand of grace upon Ezra's life. Ezra has been in a situation of difficulty along with all of God's people living in the exile. Why were they in the exile? Well, as a people, they were exiled because of their sin, because of their systematic rebellion against the Lord. And God brought them into exile to refine them. He brought them into exile to judge them. He brought them into exile to, to show them that he will not share his glory with another. But now as God brings his people back from the exile into the land, God is raising them up for a specific purpose, and that is to make much of his name. And what we see in Ezra chapter 7, verses 11 to 26, is that God is exalting Ezra, not so that Ezra's name is remembered, not so that Ezra has power and authority in Israel, not so that Ezra can, can walk around and demonstrate his faith and act holier than all the other people that he knows. No, no, no. God exalts Ezra through the hand of Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, so that Ezra can exalt the Lord. We won't review all of that passage, but some of the things that we see in Ezra chapter 7, verses 11 to 26 is that, number one, Artaxerxes is familiar with Ezra's training. He knows the, the practice and the preparation that Ezra has done. He says in verse 12 that Ezra was a man learned in the commandments of the Lord and his statutes for Israel. Ezra's exaltation doesn't come without first there being a reputation for faithfulness to God. Some of us are out there and, and we wonder, when, when, when are we going to have the chance? When are we going to have the standing? When, when are we going to be given the position to be able to do wonderful things for the Lord? Well, let me just ask, are you being faithful in what God's trust, entrusted to you now? Are you faithful in the small things so that you might be faithful in much? If God's given you financial resources, are you giving generously and sacrificially to God through the work of a local church, through the work of his, of his ministry partners, through the work of those who are, who are on the front lines of gospel work in the world? You want God to bless you with more financial resources? Well, let me just ask, are you being faithful with what he's given you? You think about the, the platform to teach. You want to have a, be, uh, the ability to teach a great Sunday school class or a great small group or a great Bible study. Well, have you taken the opportunity to teach where God has you now? Right now, I know that, that we've got nursing homes that, that are, that are shut off because of the coronavirus. But one of the things that they used to say in seminary often to us young preachers, they would remind us that if you want to preach, you don't have to have a pulpit to do it. There are all kinds of care facilities where people are starving for the word and they would love for you to come and share the word. Do you take advantage of opportunities like that? Maybe this is a season you want to do some teaching. Maybe it's a season to study God's word and write out a lesson, write out a devotion, write out some kind of thought about, about the word of God and share that with those on your social media pages. People are seeking inspiration and seeking messages of faith in God, messages that bring comfort and peace. Ezra was, was exalted because Ezra had a reputation for faithfulness. And even as the king of the Medes and the Persians, even as Artaxerxes blesses Ezra, as God favors Ezra and uses Artaxerxes to raise him up, to exalt him so that he can lead God's people back into the land of Israel, the thing that we see is that it is not about Ezra having power. It is about the house of God functioning well to the praise and the glory of the Lord. You see, 
all the work that Artaxerxes, the king, commissions Ezra to do is not bent on magnify, magnifying Ezra. It is bent on magnifying the God of Israel. He allows Ezra to have money to buy uh, animals for sacrifice and grain and, 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 and other matters for sacrifice, oil for the drink offerings. He, he allows Ezra to have these things that he needs to, to be able to, to do the work of worshiping God in the temple. He allows Ezra to have other resources so that they might use them to, to start a new administrative state. He commissions Ezra to be a civil governing authority, not just a religious authority, but a, a civil governing authority, appointing judges and magistrates who will cause the people of God to function well according to the law of God. And then he commissions Ezra to be a teacher of God's law. And he says, Ezra, everybody ought to follow the law of the Lord. And the ones who don't know it, you ought to teach them. See, God exalts Ezra through the hand of King Artaxerxes so that he might make much of the Lord. As you and I think about exaltation, one of the things that we should remember is what Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 5. He says this, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties upon him, for he cares for you. Brothers and sisters, we are not called to be haughty. We are called to be humble. We should humble ourselves under the hand of God. We should humble ourselves in the, in the season that God has brought us to. We should humble ourselves and do all that we can where we are, not to make much of ourselves, but to make much of God. And if we will humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, we can entrust that in due season, God will give us greater platforms to work for his praise and glory. You know, I can't help but think about the way that life normally goes and the way that God normally works in our lives. What we see throughout scripture is that God normally works through the ordinary means of a life in a broken, fallen world. See, for Ezra, exaltation came out of humility. Humility that occurred through the chastening hand of God working through the Babylonians, working through foreign nations in order to bring the people of Judah low. See, they, they were carried off. They were a conquered people, carried off into exile. For 70 years, they lived in a foreign land. For 70 years, they did not function in Jerusalem as the people of God, worshiping in the house of God. For 70 years, they have endured hardship. God used the ordinary means of life in a broken world, the conquering of a foreign nation to bring his people low. But God brought his people low through all ordinary grief so that he might bring them high by extraordinary grace. I believe God wants to do that in your life. I believe God wants to do that in my life. But more importantly, I believe God wants to do that right now in the life of his church. I believe that through this experience of responding to COVID-19, God is bringing us, the people of God, he's bringing us low through ordinary griefs so that he might raise us up by extraordinary grace. And here's what happens. When God raises us up by extraordinary grace, God and God alone gets the glory. See, exaltation wasn't about Ezra. Exaltation was about the Lord. So Ezra was a man of preparation. He studied the word. Ezra was a man of implementation. He practiced what he preached. Ezra was a man who was exalted. God raised him up so that he might make much of the Lord. But finally, I want you to see that Ezra was a man of magnification. In the last two verses of Ezra chapter 7, what we see is a doxology or a word of praise that comes from the heart of Ezra himself. You see there in verses 27 and 28, it says this, Blessed be the Lord the God of our fathers who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king to beautify the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem and who extended to me his steadfast love before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty officers. I took courage for the hand of the Lord my God was on me and I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. 
You see, what we see in these last verses is a word of magnification. Ezra takes time to praise the Lord, to exalt God, to celebrate God's goodness to him. And here's what we learn from Ezra. First of all, Ezra puts his life into historical context. Ezra says that the blessing is to be owed to the Lord, the God of our fathers. Ezra realizes that this whole story of exile is not about him. This whole story of exile is not about, it's not about his present circumstances, his present pleasure, his enjoyment as a leader who has standing in the hearts and, and minds of the people of Israel. No, this is ultimately about the God who has been working not in the life of just one individual, but in the life of all of his people. See, one of the things we should recognize is that our role in the life of God's people is not ultimately about us. We are one link in the chain. We are one brick in the house. One of the things I remind my people at Friendship about regularly is that there were so many godly, faithful men who came before me. And we go back regularly and we recall some of those men who faithfully served God at friendship as pastor. But I also remind our congregation regularly that, that there are going to be people who come after me. I don't know what the time frame will be. God might let me serve five or 10 or 15 or 20 years. I might serve the rest of my life. But what I know is this, regardless of whether my service is as the shepherd of friendship is long or short, I know this, somebody will come after me unless the Lord returns first. And when that happens, we will be reminded as the people of God that our life together is not about one pastor. Our life together isn't about one set of leaders in the church. Our life together is not really even about us. It's about God. So let me just remind you, church, as you worship and praise the Lord, you need to praise the Lord, not the church, not the pastor of the church, not the deacons of the church, not the Sunday school teachers of the church, not the finance people of the church. Praise the Lord of the church. Ezra says, blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers. But then we see that Ezra's worship and his praise of God, it, it recounts God giving love covenant, steadfast, faithful love to Ezra, not behind the backs of the king of Persia and his leaders, but right in front of them and even through them. See, Ezra says this, he says that, that he put such a thing, God put such a thing as this into the heart of the king to beautify the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem and who extended to me his steadfast love before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty officers. See, what happens here, what Ezra is saying here is that God has worked for his good. God has worked to bless Ezra. God has worked to bless the people of Israel. God has worked to bring them back into the land. But the way that God did it doesn't make much of Ezra. It makes much of himself. See, God is the one who is put on display here. See, magnification is all about making much of God. It is all about his name being great. Even we see that in, in the words that Artaxerxes says to Ezra in his letter commissioning him to lead God's people back in the land. We see it here even in verse 27 as Ezra's offering up a word of praise saying this is all about, about establishing and strengthening the work of the house of the Lord of the God of Israel. We see here that God is making much of his name, that it's all centered on his name being magnified. Brothers and sisters, when we prepare to study God's word, when we implement God's word in our hearts, when we, when we are exalted to make much of God, let us not give that opportunity away by thinking it is about us or thinking it is about our church, but let us be a people who take every opportunity we have to make much of God. One of the ways that we can do that practically is by regularly reminding ourselves that, that God's work in the world isn't about us, that it isn't about our local church, but it's about his kingdom growing and his name being magnified. And so we don't just pray for ourselves and we don't just pray for our local churches, but we should pray for other congregations. 
One of the things we do at Friendship is that we've we've taken some hints from other congregations and even from our associational leaders, and we pray regularly for kingdom partners, for other churches that are engaged in God's work in the world. And we pray that God blesses them and prospers them and causes them to grow every bit as much as we pray that for ourselves, because ultimately we realize that it's not about Pastor Nicholas, and it's not about uh, about the people of Friendship Baptist Church. It is about Jesus Christ being glorified. Ezra takes the opportunity to put all of this in perspective, his prepara preparation, his implementation, his exaltation, and he turns it into a word of magnification, praising, and honoring, and glorifying his Lord. And then I want you to see one last thing that even as Ezra praises God, it makes an impact on his living. Because the last thing that Ezra says is this, I took courage for the hand of the Lord my God was on me and I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. Ezra, even as he's worshiping, even as he's praising, and even as he's bringing glory to the Lord, even as he sees God's hand upon him, strengthening him, preparing him, exalting him, Ezra does not shirk that responsibility and he doesn't miss that opportunity, but he uses it to bring others into his circle to go forward in the name of Christ. One of the things that's going to happen out of this present difficulty that you and I are facing, this thing that is called COVID-19, is that we're going to build some relationships with one another that didn't exist before, all because God used ordinary griefs to bring us low an extraordinary grace to bring us high. And through that, we're going to come up with others who have strengthened their own walk with the Lord, who are ready to be used of God. And there are going to be gospel partnerships formed out of this present difficulty that would have never been formed any other way. Heaven help us if they're not. Ultimately, brothers and sisters, as we walk through Ezra chapter 7, as we are introduced to Ezra, as we see Ezra implementing the word that he studied into practice in his own life, as we see God exalting Ezra by leading him back into the land of promise under the authority of the king of Persia, and then as we see Ezra turning and giving a word of blessing to the Lord, what we find is that God reveals through his working in Ezra's life, God reveals that he perfectly provides for his own. Ezra could have labored the rest of his life in obscurity and he would have been faithful and he would have worked well in the word of God to influence those who are around him. But God provided for Ezra an opportunity to take his faithfulness forward into new realms and to make much of God's name. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter what platform you have right now. It doesn't matter how big your circle of influence is. I encourage you to be like Ezra. Always be preparing for what's next. Always be studying God's word. Always be learning more about God. Implement it in your own life. Do what God has called you to do. Uh, put the word into practice. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't do one thing, but say another. Be, be a one single-minded person. Trust that in his time, God will expand your opportunity to make even more of his name. And until he does, keep being faithful right where you are. Boy, I, I cannot wait for our congregation to come back together, for us to be able to have this Bible study in the fellowship hall and, and drink our coffee together and learn from God's word. I can't wait to ask you some questions and be able to hear some responses. It's going to be a great day. But I am so thankful that we're able to have this time together to connect in this way and to be reminded that even if we can't be together in person, we can be together in spirit. Friendship, let me remind you of a couple of things as we go forward into the days to come. First of all, Digital Discipleship Series begins tomorrow, 7 a.m. every morning. Be posted to Facebook. You can also catch it on YouTube or on the church website, but it'll be a Digital Discipleship Series. Five-minute videos, five-minute videos is what I'm striving for throughout this time, walking through the book 
of 1 Thessalonians. We've got eight themes that we're going to talk about this week. We're talking about prayer in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. So you catch that this week. Share it with those around you. Continue to grow in your understanding of God's Word. Number two, Wednesday night, we're going to try Facebook Live for our Bible study. I'll try to have a, a prepared video just in case, but we're going to try to do this again Wednesday night at 7 p.m. So you join me, host a watch party on your Facebook page, and invite other to join with us. Seven o'clock Wednesday night, we'll open God's Word together. And then if you didn't check out the website, I hope you did, but if you haven't checked out the website, lots of new resources available to you and even more coming tomorrow. Uh, we've got a couple of our children's workers who are working on some content for children, and hopefully we're going to be able to get that up. Uh, we've got some, some other discipleship opportunities that are coming and some resources that we want to make available to you. So keep checking the church website for updates, and we're going to try to provide as much leadership in God's Word and in discipleship as we can throughout this season. What can you do this week? Well, number one, even though we're apart from one another, you can engage God in worship. You ought to do that here on the Lord's Day because this is when we normally worship together. But you can engage God in worship every day. Every day you can read his word. Every day you can sing a hymn. Every day you can pray. Why don't you make a priority this week of doing those things? And if you've got more time on your hands because of, uh, of working from home or maybe not being able to work as much right now, why don't you use some of that time? to engage God in worship. Number two, you can engage one another in fellowship. Boy, I, I cannot begin to tell you how much the text messages that I received this morning saying, Pastor, we listened to the message. Pastor, we worshiped together with you. We were so thankful for that message that you brought to us. Brothers and sisters, I can't tell you how much that meant to me. Your ministry of encouragement to me, uh, it means more than I will ever be able to tell you. I, can I just tell this to you? And I know we've got some other folks watching from other congregations right now. And, uh, and I want to share this so that we can all put this in perspective. Not being able to gather on campus and in person for worship is not a break for your pastor. In fact, I think every pastor I know has worked harder in this past week to bring God's word to God's people than he's probably ever worked before. I, I, want, I don't say that because I need uh, your pity. I don't say that to try to make much of me, but I say that to help you to put this in perspective and to realize that one of the reasons that we've done this is not to give ourselves a break. We, we have taken this time away to honor the civil authorities, to protect the health of our own congregation and to promote the health of our friends and neighbors. But understand that your encouragement in this season, it goes so far. I, I have been so tired this week, but I told somebody this morning, I, I'm renewed. I'm excited. I, I am, I am so thankful for this opportunity. As tired as I've been and as hard as I've worked in recent days, I think this has been the best week I've had in all the years that I've been serving in gospel ministry because I have seen God do some incredible things. So brothers and sisters, we can continue to engage one another in fellowship. We can be an encouragement to one another. We can write cards. We can make phone calls. We, we can connect over FaceTime and we can connect over Zoom and all other sorts of social media applications. Make use of these things. Make use of these technologies and let's get together and encourage one another. You can engage God in worship. You can engage one another in fellowship. But I hope you don't forget that this week you can engage the world in discipleship. Some of you are still working and, and you're going to encounter some people who are scared, frightened, panicked, overcome by the situation in life. You've got a chance to share Jesus with them. Jesus who promised that in this world we would have trouble, but we could be of good cheer because he overcame the world. Jesus who says that we should cast our cares upon him because he really does care for us. My dear friend, we've got an opportunity to engage our world in discipleship, to make disciples of Jesus Christ by, by telling people the wonderful news of the Savior of the world and of his offer of redemption by faith in his name. Can I pray for you before we go? My dear Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for these dear friends who've joined us. I thank you most of all for the word that nourishes us. It is bread to our souls. God, help us this week not to waste our time, but to keep preparing 
to keep implementing, to wait for the time when you might exalt us and give us even greater platforms, not so that we can make much of our own name, but so that we can magnify yours. Help us to be a people who engage you in worship, one another in fellowship, and the world in discipleship for Jesus' sake. Amen. Good night, friends.